What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. Today we've got a slightly different episode for you all and the idea actually stems from a fan of a channel. David Crespo, who's a college student, got in touch with me a few weeks ago with a theory that he had about Greenland sharks and how they catch their prey. He basically wants me to review his theory compared to existing theories, which I thought could be kind of fun to do. But I suppose the general premise of the episode should appeal to lots of you out there and it is how on earth does the slowest moving predatory shark catch its prey? Greenland shark are pretty cool anyway and we actually did a creature feature on them not that long ago so if you wanted to watch that you can click this link here but today we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into this specific aspect of their lives so greenland sharks as their name suggests tend to inhabit the icy cold waters of the north atlantic and the arctic waters around you guessed it greenland they generally tend to prefer water that's somewhere between minus one and 10 degrees celsius so it's pretty damn cold <laughs> When you live in waters this temperature, it's really important to conserve energy. So the Greenland shark tends to live its life at a slower pace. And when I say slower pace, I mean real slow. <laughs> These sharks tend to cruise at around 0.34 meters per second, making them the slowest shark in the world. For example, if you were traveling at that speed from the top of the UK to the bottom of the UK, it would take you 52 days. So pretty slow. Now, Greenland sharks aren't your typical slow moving shark species that feeds off plankton, like your whale sharks or your mega mouths. These sharks are actually predatory sharks. So they feed off pretty large prey items. They are known to be scavengers to be fair. And when you're a scavenger, you don't really need to move as fast because it's likely that your prey prey is already dead. However, they are also active hunters too, feeding on salmon and seals. There are even reports of Greenland sharks attacking caribou as they drink from the banks of river mouths. But today we're going to be focusing on their attacks on seals. Back in the late 90s, a spate of mysterious injuries on seals alerted scientists on Sable Island in Nova Scotia who were pretty confused about what was causing the injuries. The culprit, which for a long time was dubbed the corkscrew killer, sparked serious debate in the scientific community. Three theories were eventually reached, which were boat propellers, other adult seals, and Greenland sharks. I should point out that it's never actually been proven which one of these three were responsible for these injuries, and it could quite easily be a combination of all three of them. However, if it was Greenland sharks, it begs the question, how does such a slow moving shark catch a pretty agile animal like a seal? Now, currently the most widely accepted theory on this is from Japanese marine biologist Yuki Watanabe. Seals will often sleep in the water, and this behavior is pretty commonly observed across the world. When they do sleep, they sleep pretty heavily, and there are some reports of people going up to sleeping seals and poking them and not actually waking them up. Although, don't try this at home, guys. Please. <laughs> Anyway, Watanabe's theory is that Greenland sharks move so slowly in the water, they remain undetected by the sleeping seals and can approach and attack from below. The theory holds some decent weight and it's pretty widely accepted that this is a plausible scenario. Now, onto David's theory. David believes that Watanabe's theory explains how Greenland sharks can catch seals in their more southern range, i.e. the North Atlantic, but his theory might explain how they do this in their more northern Arctic range. In the north, the seals create breathing holes in the sea ice to enable them to come to the surface and breathe when they need to. To do this, they claw and bite through the sea ice, which is probably a pretty time-consuming activity for them. And they have to do this fairly regularly to stop those holes from freezing over. So David believes that Greenland sharks will look for seals who are too busy with the creation and maintenance of their breathing holes and sneak up on them from below, much like in Watanabe's theory. Now, I like this theory definitely, and it's not impossible that seals doing this might be distracted for long enough for a Greenland shark to sneak up on them. However, being a scientist, I've got to pick apart a few holes in this. When we're looking at interactions between animals, we have to take into account relationships between all animals. Greenland sharks are not the only predator after seals in their more northern Arctic range. Where there is sea ice and seals, you can almost guarantee there'll be polar bears. Polar bears often use the sea ice to maneuver their way around that frozen landscape in search of seals. So if you're a seal, it's perhaps not the smartest move to have a little sleep on the sea ice where you might leave yourself exposed to predation from polar bears. Therefore, a potentially safer place to have your nap is within the breathing hole that you've just created. As a result, I still think the seals will be sleeping in those breathing holes, potentially leaving themselves exposed to the Greenland sharks from below. So Watanabe's theory still stands in their more northern Arctic range. Although, wow, it's a real tough life for seals. Attacked by polar bears from above, attacked by sharks from below. What a torrid time. <laughs> So while David's theory is interesting, I feel like seals know how risky their lives are and are pretty wary of what's going on in their surroundings, at least while they're awake. Now, this is not to say that David's theory is impossible, and I'm sure there are cases of Greenland sharks that have attacked and killed seals while they've been creating those breathing holes. Although for now, 
I still think I'm back in Watanabe's theory. Massive thanks to David for getting in touch and sharing his theory with me. This is exactly what science is all about. It's about getting stuck in and thinking outside of the box and asking questions. So props to you, David. What do you guys at home think about this? Does David's theory sound plausible to you? Or are you still back in Watanabe's theory? I wanna hear all your thoughts in the comments below. And a quick reminder here, if you have some cool video ideas, please do get in touch like David did and we can try and see if we can make a video out of it. I promise I'm not that scary. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the Sharp Eyes channel below where you can stay up to date with all of our latest videos. Until then, see you next time.